so uh, a, a portion of the talk will be the, like the first the first part of it will be some stuff that some of you have already heard and seen from me but I think it's important for me to give context to who I am and and um, the things that inspire me um, and um, you know get those people who didn't meet with me in the workshops caught up um, but the first thing that I have um, written down on my notes is what is this horse? And I'm I'm actually very curious to know if anybody can tell me what the deal is with these plastic horses around Portland. Those are uh, done by an artist named Scott Wayne, Indiana, and he lived in Portland for I think up until maybe five eight years ago, um, and he put these horses all over town took pictures of them, and people would take pictures of them. And maybe so time he comes back into town, he puts more out. Okay, yeah, because I've seen a, a pink one down near the galleries that's about half the size of this horse, and then I was walking around in Northeast where I'm staying with some friends, and I saw this one the other day, and um, I just thought that, you know, since I have a very observational practice, as most of you know, and I'm always walking around and I'm photographing things that are interesting to me, I saw this and I immediately sent it to my sister because we had this inside joke about what are these ponies. So thank you for clearing that up. Um, and then the other funny overlap with this is that um, you can see these are, these are some of the figurines that the students have been working with um, and coating in different coats of gesso over the last week and a half. So I just thought that, I don't know, there's, there's something about horses that's happening for me now in Portland. My spirit animal or something. So um, the first thing that I'm gonna do is give you a little bit of background and context to my work and my process. Um, and then I will walk you through two previous installations that I created in the last couple of years. These will be two works that none of you have seen yet. So I swapped some things out and swapped some new things in so that it, you know, you guys will be seeing something different, especially those of you who came to my workshop more than once. Um, and then after I talk about those two installations and walking you through my process, um, then I will get into my experience here at Clark. So there's tons of photos of all of you guys working in the space, and I'll go into some more detail about um, how I developed that workshop and um, the, sh the work in my show Splat. So this is just a quote that I saw that, that floated by on my news feed on Facebook this afternoon, and it felt really perfect and very fitting for all of the repetitive pattern making that I'm doing and the, and the grid formations and all of my work downstairs. And I'll just read it out loud to you as you're reading along. It's, there is freedom in the insistent and endless repetition of an image. Through a combination of memorization and a limiting process-based approach, I go in search of the quality of the object. Challenging myself to explore the same object by drawing it over and over again, I begin to understand its essence. During this process, the materials are the reality, guiding and limiting my work. And this is just something that um, a Seattle artist named Fiona McGuigan said on Facebook today, and I thought it was really appropriate. So keep that in mind as we, as we move on. But first, um, I just want to talk briefly about some of some of the inspirations that um, <clears throat> some of the things that inspire my work and inspire me personally and that speak to me. So as you all know, I have a, a very observational practice. I go around taking photos of things. Um, sometimes I go out intending to take photos of things and sometimes I'm just going about my day and I see things that are interesting to me for some reason or another and I snap a photo. I don't know exactly why I'm doing it at the time, but I know eventually that, that that will somehow find its way into my work. So these are two opposing images, both taken in my neighborhood. One is from one side of the neighborhood and one is from another side of the neighborhood. The image on the left um, is a gentleman who has a hauling business and he takes all of those uh, scraps and um, um, junk that he hauls and he arranges and rearranges them in his yard. And I, I find particularly fascinating people who maybe don't consider themselves to be quote unquote artists 
but who are able to have a, a very unique personal vision and accomplish that with very little means. On the right-hand side, that's an image of um, the much more affluent part of my neighborhood, and I am just really curious about the, the differences in the way that the house on the left and the house on the right have decided to customize their yards. So on the left here is a quote-unquote Nissan. We're, we're not quite sure if that's a Nissan or not. Um, and then on the right is a car that I saw walking through northeast Portland today. Um, and this is just another example of, of people who have very unique visions for their personal belongings, and they aren't afraid to, to express those visions. Um, the, another thing that I am interested in is the Northwest color palette. So the way that this green moss glows, it seems like a very artificial color, but it's actually found in nature. And I use a lot of hot pink duct tape in my work. And so, you know, it's like you don't think of hot pink as being a color that you find in nature, but there are, there are sunsets where you see that very, that very kind of pink. Um, I'm also interested in both of these images in the way that the vegetation is trying to reclaim the man-made structures that have been put on top of them. And I love the sense of time of those, those roots that are coming up through the pavers and pushing those pavers up. So two more comparisons here. On the left is a photograph I took at the bottom of my street, and that's the side of an apartment building on, um, at, at the end of my street. And on the right is uh, a watercolor and a collage that I created from that photograph. And they are actually both about the same size. So there was a series that I did called Backyards, and it was kind of this voyeuristic thing that I was doing, going around and checking out the way that people were um, leaving piles of garbage in, in the, behind their houses. So you would walk by the front, and you wouldn't know that it was there, but you would kind of sneak around the back, and then all of a sudden, you know, their, their junk and their garbage would become um, visible to you. So the image on the left is really interesting to me because I work a lot with pattern, and I work a lot with a limited color palette or a very specific color palette. And so everything in that image is some kind of red, some version of it. And there's all kinds of um, patterns, like the pattern in the brick, the lines, those floral, floral patterns on the, on the um, sofa cushions. Um, and then I, I'm just really interested in the way that that sheet is draped over that um, cushion in the top right corner. There's also all kinds of textures in this, and I use a lot of texture in my work. So there's the texture of the gravel, there's the texture of the, the fuzzy, like almost like a, a velveteen seat cushion, um, and then the industrial yet natural texture of the brick. And then the last thing that is really interesting to me is shadows. And I know a lot of you have heard this anecdote already, but I, I had an office job that I was pretty miserable at, and the only saving grace is that behind me was floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out over the Puget Sound in Seattle, and I was on the very top floor of this tower in downtown Seattle. And so in front of me was this, this desk space that had all of these accoutrements, all of this like office materials that to me represented what was making me really miserable at the time, all these, th these tools that I had to work with that weren't doing anything for me except making me sad. <laughs> and all I had to do was swivel around and I would be able to see the most incredible sunsets. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think I saw some whales one time. Um, so the contradiction between my two views that were so close together was pretty interesting to me. And, Another effect of those beautiful sunsets is these incredible shadows that were being cast and that were changing over time. And so I would just sit there and over this very limited window of maybe 20 or 30 minutes, I would watch these shadows change shape and change color and move across the wall in front of me. So it took these items that were 
rep you know, they represented something sort of miserable for me and made them more mysterious and curious and beautiful. So some examples of jobs that I have now that do not make me miserable are, um, this is, this is an image taken from a collaborative installation that I led last summer at Cornish College of the Arts. And I teach a four week foundations course there and it's, um, it meets every day for three hours and there's high school students from all over the world who come. And it's, uh, it's a 30 person class and they all stay in the dorms. And it's, it's basically like um, sleep away camp for hardcore art students and they are there to build their portfolio and get ready to go to college, go to art college. And then the following week every summer I teach an installation intensive and so I work in the Cornish main gallery and I guide students through the um, concepting and then execution of creating a site specific installation in the gallery using items found from Goodwill. So we go on a big Goodwill shopping trip together and that's a lot of fun. And then another one of my jobs that's part-time that I do two or three days a week, I've been doing this for about three years, is um, being an artist assistant for a, um, a commission-based artist uh, named Katie Stone. And this is uh, a group of us installing in a, court, a new courthouse building in Kirkland, Washington, right outside of Seattle. Um, and she works with these um, basically these these aluminum laser cut pieces and I do everything from repetitive sanding for six to seven hours a day, um, drilling holes for a few hours at a time, coating individual pieces in oil paint, um, spray painting for hours at a time. So you can see now why I wanted to sort of repeat that experience in the gallery during the workshops. Um, it was really interesting to see, you know, I, I promise I wasn't using you, but I like, I, I love this job so much because it's so, it's so relaxing to me. It's so meditative. Something really nice about getting into the rhythm of doing something and doing that one thing over and over and over again for six or seven hours at a time and then going home and feeling like you've really completed something. And then up until October, I was a member of Soil Artist Run Gallery in Seattle, and I was a member for almost six years, and that was just an incredible experience for me because I got the, the opportunity to show, I think, in over 10 exhibitions there, a number of them were solo shows, and it was kind of neat to re continue to reimagine the space through new installations. So I think I did four or five different installations in that space, and. Um, and it was almost like a record of my, my experience of growing through that organization, starting in 2009 and every year having a new installation and seeing the way that my work grew and changed over the six years. So this is my home in Seattle. And those are my yard gnomes and my chainsaw carved rabbit question mark. Not, we're not sure if it's a rabbit or a dog or some hybrid version. And my studio is where that pink arrow is. Um, as you can see, it's a pretty small space. It's only 12 by 12 feet. It's a converted bedroom. And um, I like to show images of my studio to let you know that um, you don't have to fret if you can't find a giant industrial space to make your work in. You can really make your work anywhere. And you just sort of adapt to it. And these are examples of some paintings that I did that was in a show um, actually in Portland at Portland Center Stage a couple of years ago. And it's a series called Stacked and Piled. Okay, so the two pieces that I'm going to walk you through um, uh, of, the, uh, of those two, this first one is called Three Generations of Decorations. And it was a 2014 site-specific installation at the McDowell Colony, which is a residency that's over 100 years old and is in a very small town in New Hampshire. And I was there exactly this time last year for two months, March and April. And this was my, in comparison to my last image of, of, of my home studio, this was my gigantic studio that I 
we'll probably never have an opportunity to work in again, but we'll see. Um, so the way that the residency works is that there's about 30, 30 artists from across disciplines there at any given time and people are coming and going on a rotating basis. So when I come in on a Tuesday, then the next morning someone who's been there for eight weeks is leaving. And so it's just staggered and you keep, I think I met 60 to 70 different people from all over the world. And everything from writers to dancers to um, you know filmmakers, uh, musicians, and visual artists. So just to give you an example of how I was being really uh, ob observant while I was there, is I'm going to kind of walk you through my day. Um, this is the inside of my studio near the front door, and <clears throat> excuse me, and I. Um, I didn't come to the McDowell Colony with any preconceived um, project in mind, but I did know I wanted to do a site-specific piece in my studio, um, and I did know that I wanted to use found objects primarily. So um, inside my studio, I started to just sort of sit and meditate and, and, and look around and um, start to notice, again, the changing light like I did at my, my old miserable job, except this was a, a wonderful, beautiful experience. Um, and I, I loved the way that the light would, that grid of light against the wall would, would shift and change and get, get bigger and longer and the color would change over time. And then I also liked how it mimicked the grid in the windows to the right of it and then the grid that it's being reflected from, from the door. So the walk to and from the dining hall looked like this. And as you can see, it was very icy and cold. It was about six to seven degrees, six, yeah, six degrees every day. So I was very bundled up and very much not used to that climate. Um, but I made do. So one thing that I loved about the colony hall where we, where we took all our meals is the way that the sun would hit it a certain way at certain times of day or if the, um, just if the conditions were right, and it looked like the building was glowing, like it was emanating light as opposed to reflecting it. And then I would walk away from Colony Hall after eating my breakfast. We got three meals a day, and they were all hot meals. Your lunch gets delivered to you. Um, and I would walk away from it, and I would have to walk down this long, this 10-minute path, and I was noticing all of the perspective you know, like the way that the two vanishing lines and the way that the trees are getting closer and closer together as they're getting further away in space. And I was also noticing the tracks as pattern that were made by the vehicles that were going, going down the path, in addition to the man-made tracks of all the shoes. And then I started to notice in my bedroom the pattern of the wallpaper, wall, wallpaper and the interruption of that with those uh, what it, thermostat, the thermostat and the fire alarm. So if those two objects weren't there, there would be a sense that the pattern could continue forever. So I liked how these two things interrupted um, my vision of that wall. And then to the left is the floor, the floorboards, and. My friends are here. <laughs> Come in. Um, so to, to the left, I'm noticing the pattern in, in the floorboards. And to the right, I was starting to notice the pattern in, um, in the rug by my bedside. And then I also started taking notice of things like the, um, the ornate bottom to this very old dresser. So flourishes and little like extra decorative details that don't necessarily need to be there, but they are representative of a certain time that it was made. And again, on the left-hand side, the, the, the fire alarm, um, it was a kind of interruption in, in the wall. So I would walk by the wall, and if the fire alarm box hadn't been there, um, it would just be a continuous wall of white. And to the right of that is doily. There were doilies everywhere. And I was just kind of noticing um, 
just the inherent pattern in a doily, and then also the fact that um, doilies are associated with, I don't know, grandmas. <laughs> So another example of an interruption was walking through this beautiful New Hampshire forest and seeing, seeing these bright orange posted no trespassing signs everywhere. And so something that is an experience that is supposed to be this really beautiful experience is like being interrupted by these, the kind of the violent way that the, that the sign is being nailed into the trunk of that tree. It's kind of impossible not to notice that. So inside my studio, I'm taking all of this visual information and I'm bringing it with me into the studio and I'm thinking like, how can I use all of the patterning and all of these details um, from my daily experience, how can I take all of that stuff and turn that into an installation? So this is what the space looked like before I started making the installation. And whenever I'm working on an installation, I'm always doing some kind of drawing, a series of drawings or paintings or collages, and these are two examples of what I was working on at the time. And this was my messy work surface. Um, I had found a, I went to the local recycling center, and I dug through all of the old magazines, and I found a quilting catalog from the 90s. And you better bet there were some really weird things in there. So I, I started cutting out all of the quilts and there was this really, there was some interesting stuff that was happening because the way that the quilts were photographed wasn't just flat hanging on a wall or flat hanging over the surface of a bed, but they were like, they were like neatly folded over something or, um, or hanging in a weird way. And so there were all kinds of weird shadows that were happening. So I, so I cut these shapes out. And I didn't know exactly what I would do with them, but I knew that I would work them into the installation somehow. So across from my work table is this, um, I guess people in design call it an idea board. And I created an idea board for myself, which was basically like coming up with my color palette and my materials and maybe some of the imagery that I might be using in the installation. And then on the floor there, you see I've kind of organized all of my findings from the recycling center into these different piles. And I just um, would pull from that as I, as I saw fit. So um, I decided to work with the furniture that I had in the space. So if you go back here, this is all the furniture that was there when I came in. And I mm -hmm. thought it was really funny because it, it seemed kind of excessive. There were, there were like four, five chairs and a stool and like a bunch of lamps and too many tables. So I edited down the furniture that I wasn't going to use and I um, ended up with these four pieces. So it was a lazy boy chair or a wing back chair, a big table, a lamp, floor lamp, which I took off the floor and put on the table and this chair that I put in the right corner. And then I just started um, taking all of those materials from the recycling center in addition to materials that I got at the local hardware store. So I was using, I wasn't really using a whole lot of art supplies, but it was mostly things that I got from, you know, like house paint and duct tape and HVAC tape and that kind of thing. And then all of the paper that you see like hanging on that, on that line coming towards us, that's all paper that I found at the recycling center. And um, the cardboard too, I found all of that there as well. And I took this line and I hung it from that back wall and I, and I brought it out into space. And I think now looking back that that was like a way of mimicking that perspective that I was seeing walking through the forest down the path. And I noticed that if I shine a light on it, I get some pretty interesting shadows. So as you can see, I'm just sort of responding to something that I've done and I'm responding to the material with the next move and the next material. And it's just sort of naturally building. So this is what the finished piece looked like. 
and I'll show you a few details here. I showed everybody in the in the workshops, I showed everybody a piece that had a bunch of shadows of ladders in it. Does everybody remember that? Um, so this is the first piece that I started incorporating the actual, like a record of the process of creating it. And so the ladder represents to me a, a record of having created the piece. So on that left side there, you see the, the ladder shadow painted in. And then you can see all those egg cartons that I found at the recycling center, those are all hanging. From that, um, from that line that's coming out from that sort of top right area. And I started playing with shining different light sources on the same object and how I could get different kinds of shadows coming off of it. And I painted some of the shadows in and I left some of the shadows just as they were as shadows. I liked that illusion. This is kind of my favorite vantage point. This, is, this piece is 25 feet wide that back wall is 25 feet wide, and it comes out about 10 feet. And so it's, it's kind of, you can see from this photo, it's kind of, it was nearly impossible to get a great image of it because of, um, just because of the way that the studio was laid out. Uh, so whenever I, you know, submit materials for applications, it's always like I gotta choose the right angle that, that I wanna show them, and this always ends up being that angle. It just sort of feels right for some reason. And you can see all those double shadows happening on the right-hand side there. And then another interesting thing to me about uh, the shadows that are happening in this, in this uh, detail is the way that there's just a little bit of light. There's some space between the blue painted area that's supposed to come along the edge of that shadow and then the actual shadow, does everybody see that, like about a half inch space? Um, and it was all dependent on the conditions in there. So if the, if the air conditioning was blowing or the heat was blowing more likely because it was seven degrees outside, um, then everything on the line would kind of flap and move. And so the shadows and the way that the shadows would line up with the painted areas would be constantly in flux. And then I included on that table there, you see there's a little, it's a bottle, it's a whiskey bottle. <laughs> so that's just another example of me using the materials that I was quote unquote working with in the space and, um, and, and transforming them so that they become something else, but they're still sort of recognizable. And then working them into the piece. And, and this one I cast a bunch of shadows from and painted, you know, painted all these patterns directly on the table. And then this is the last image from that piece. Um, what does this remind people of? This shape, a monopoly? Mm -hmm. Scrabble? Mouse traps. Okay, I can see that. Pile of brownies. <laughs> Yes, so he said it looks like a serving plate on the ground. So the piece is called Three Generations of Decorations. And so this is emblematic of my grandparents' home when I was growing up. Did any of you grow up with television trays? Like a tin, it's a tin fold up tray that you sit down on a plastic covered couch in my grandparents' case. And I would put this, this tin tray over my lap and we would eat things from a box or a can because that's what they cooked in the 50s, I guess, and they never let, they never let that go. And, and then, um, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a little bit of an illusion happening on the ground there. There's the actual brass plate. Does everybody see that, the real brass plate? It's the one that's sort of closest to us, the one that's not piled up. And then all of the other ones are cardboard versions of that. And so I like to kind of plug in these, these little like inside jokes, these little secrets that if you spend enough time with the piece, then they, you start to become aware of them. And this is just a shot from an open studio that I did. And that was another great thing about being at this residency is that I had the, <clears throat> I had the benefit of, um, 
getting feedback from all of these different people, from all these different disciplines with all of these different experiences and opinions. And this is us being goofy. And that kind of gives you a sense of scale, too. At the end of your stay, there's this thing called a tombstone in everybody's studio. And these go all the way back to the 50s, maybe even slightly earlier. And everybody writes their name on it and puts it on the wall. And so in my studio, there are about 25 of these. And it's, it's pretty cool to see, to see history like that proof of history in front of you like that, working in that space every day and just thinking about all the people who have been in there before you. Okay, so the second piece I wanna show you is called Borderlands. And this was an animation and collage on plywood and this is from November of last year. Um, like I said earlier, I'm always doing, as I'm working on installations, I'm always also working on drawings. So I did a series of these drawings in my composition book this guy, and um, you can see how I am responding to the lines, the ruled lines inside the notebook. And I'm basically like making, I'm using the same set of tools and I'm using a similar color palette and I'm using similar shapes, but I'm creating a series of drawings that are all slightly different from one another. And I was thinking it kind of reminded me of a screen for some reason, like a screen to project something on. So I thought um, that it would be nice to enlarge that and then create an animation that I projected on top of that that related to those drawings. So I want to show you this, potentially show you this animated GIF. So these are an example of the drawings that I was doing in my sketchbook to try and imagine um, how I would scale up from, from the drawings in my notebook to this large scale installation. And I just like to show examples of, of, of the work that I do in my sketchbook and you know all of the sort of preparations that I do, translating the work from small scale to large scale so that it kind of demystifies you know, the life of an artist. This is the screen as it's built in my studio, and it's seven feet wide by five and a half feet tall, and then I took a jigsaw and I cut that jagged edge at the bottom, and it's, it's hung with French cleats, so it sits about two inches off the, off the wall, so it looks like it's floating. That seemed kind of important to me, too. And then I went into the space with it. I hung it up and I projected, so you can see in the center there, the negative space, that white space in the very center, that's where the projection will go. I'll show you in the next slide. But this is with all of the lights on and the projector off. This is what you see. So this is all of the material that I collaged around the projected light. So then that's what it looks like when the lights are off. And it almost looks like like a, like a television screen, like the, like the projection is coming from inside the piece and not being projected on top of the surface. Or at least that's what people have said. And then I'm sure the video is not going to work, but you can see it on my website. So it just basically those three, you can see those three shapes in the center, those are moving and changing at different rates. So they're coming in and out and they're, the, image, the image within those shapes is changing and rotating. This says, oh, hey, look, we finally arrived at Clark. Um, I'm going to talk about the right side of the gallery first, which is where my show is, called Splat. And then I'll get to the left side of the gallery, which is all of the work that you, that you have done together and with me and as a group. Um, so I came down here in January, and I photographed the space. And this is a photograph of the show that was up um, a couple months ago. And I took that photograph home and I was making a series of these um, 9 by 12 inch watercolors and it's just an all over pattern that I was doing. 
And it was really just putting a mark down, working left to right, top to bottom, and then starting again at the top, and going left to right, top to bottom, putting, putting a new mark down. And cr creating this, um, this all over pattern and trying out different colors together and trying out different symbols like a raindrop. Um, I added a lot of like little hashtag marks and, and you know, just design elements that on their own have some sort of meaning to them. But then when they are used in an overall pattern like this, they sort of, they just become part of the drawing. And then this is the sketch that I did in my sketchbook for the piece that's downstairs in the gallery right now. And typically I do about six to 10 sketches for every installation I make. But for this one, for some reason, it only took, I did one sketch before this, which I threw in the garbage. And then I did this one and it just kind of felt right. So then I worked to translate that piece, the, the small drawing into these large scale materials. I went to the Goodwill and I just started digging through, digging through the bins and digging through the racks and finding things that spoke to me for one reason or another. another. And you can see that um, four, of these, four, of the, four of these framed images that have drips on them, t in two and two are, are pairs. So that top two is a set, and then that bottom two that's laying down on the table, that's a set. And so there was something about things that were twins or, or things that were similar to each other but slightly different that was interesting to me. And then I also liked the fact that they felt like they were from some a specific era, one of which I'm not exactly sure, but they had they had like a, a sense to them that they were from another time. So this is in the gallery in progress, installing a couple weeks ago. And then this is what the finished piece looks like. Um, here's a detail from that piece, and you can see again how I'm playing with the pattern that's painted on the wall and the way that it put butts up against the shadows that are happening next to it, as though the shadow, even though it's just, um, it just, it's a property of light, so it's not physical. I mean, it is physical, but it's not like, you can't feel it. Um, I love the idea that that is, is forcing the painted area, which is actually more of a tactile, physical material. It's giving that illusion that the light is, 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 like, is somehow stopping that paint. And then in this piece here on the left, um, I, I really enjoyed the way that the grid area was being reflected in that very glossy paint on the surface of the shelf. another installation shot of three of the paintings in the show. The one on the left, from left to right, it's um, drip grid double vision, drip grid pink, and drip grid green. And there's my studio assistant, Kiki. And these are the collage materials that I create myself. And it's really important to me that I'm creating them myself and that I'm not using borrowed materials. So. I'm taking things like sheets and crumpled up paper and the insides of envelopes and I'm photocopying them and then I'm either tiling them or I'm cutting them up and I'm using them in my, in my work. And then one thing that I pointed out to students last week is if you notice that red and white and blue stripe pattern, it comes forward in some areas and it sort of sits to the back in others. And that's just the nature of the, um, the density of the print. So if I pumped up the print in the photocopier and I made it like very saturated, then it was very, very bold and very graphic. And then if I turned it down a little bit, or a lot even, or I did a photocopy of a photocopy as opposed to the original, I would get this very subdued print and so that, that makes it look like it's sitting further back in space. And then these two pieces in the show on the left is called Drip Grid Luna Moth, and on the right is Drip Grid Eggs Over Easy, because of those egg splat shapes at the bottom. 
And I consider these two to be a pair. I don't think they need to live together necessarily, but they were made at the same time. And you can see some obvious similarities in the structure in the way that I, that I compose these two. One of the main differences is that on the left, I have, I, I have the um, painted, the watercolor painted area actually pulling up from the surface instead of glued down to the surface. So there's just another sense of dimension. Okay, so for the student workshops, this is what my initial sketches looked like in my, in my sketchbook. And this was before I came down here to actually start the workshops. Um, but you, I just wanted to give you an example of, of um, my line of thinking um, before I came down and started working with all of you. So on the left, you can see that um, the wallpaper pattern it was going to be m way more complicated, and it didn't have an element of chance like it ended up having in this show. Um, and then on the right-hand side, all of those found objects that people put coats of gesso over, um, that's, what, that's what these shapes are representing. Uh, originally, I thought maybe we would be able to like, make, make them from clay or do plaster casts of them, something that was just way too complicated and that was too time-consuming. Um, that we just, it just, we just wouldn't have enough time to make these things. So I ended up just using some found objects. And you'll also see that um, my intention was to create drips around these things to make them look like they were, I don't know, melting onto the surface they're sitting on. And I, you know, ran out of time. So they are in the state that they are in, in the gallery, but they will, uh, they will definitely work their way into a future installation. So this is what once I set the space up, this is, this is how I knew um, the workshops would, would roll along. So that's what, that's what it looked like on the first day before anybody came in. So you can see all those found objects on the front table, and then, and then the gridded wallpaper on the back left corner. And in the right corner, there is an animated gift station. So I had everybody sign their name, and I took a photo afterwards, and then the next person would sign their name, took a photo after that, and I have the, I have the gift going downstairs, so you'll get to see the way that that, that that built through time. So the Chance Collaborative Wallpaper was pretty fun. Um, I, before everybody got there, I gridded out the wallpaper into um, one by one foot squares, and then we had uh, two students on the ground rolling dice, and they were calling out the numbers that they were getting to the people standing up or on the ladder, and they were writing those numbers into the grid. And they were just kind of working left to right, top to bottom, just sort of randomly putting the numbers in. And we noticed that there were a lot of numbers that ended up double or triple next to each other, so we had to go back in later and change some of those because it would just end up like a big blob of yellow or a big blob of pink instead of alternating between different colors. Just like that, <laughs> that pink area, and then that, that brown area at the bottom left. So every one of these numbers was associated with a color of paint. And over the course of the week, different people would come in, and they would spend 45 minutes to an hour matching up the paint color with the number on the grid. So once, once the paint started to go up, um, I took these shapes that people were cutting and I taped them up and I tried to, tried to decide what direction I wanted these shapes to hang in and how many of them I wanted to have on here, whether I wanted them to be next to each other or staggered, alternating. And I think it's Michaela. Michaela came up, Michaela and I decided that this would probably be the best use of the shapes. Um, I think there are 270 squares and we only had half as many cut shapes. So we figured, okay, every other one and all facing the same way would be great. And then um, a shout out to Michaela and Matt and John. This is John finishing the very last square. So thank you, thank, thank you all three of you for coming in on the drop-in hours. It was really great having the help finishing this wallpaper. So then after everybody left, I put in all of this hand-drawn pattern into, into the leftover boxes. 
So we've got horizontal lines, vertical lines, diagonal lines, and these little curly Q things. So this is everybody hard at work cutting. And this is a shape that was taken from my work on the other side of the wall. I wanted, I wanted the, the wall to be there to sort of designate that it was two separate projects, but I wanted there to be a nice flow between the two so that you could tell that both sides were related. So in every class, a group of students would come and put a coat of gesso on these animals, and I think there were about five or six layers. And I liked the idea, I liked the idea of coating figurines or found objects in a single color of paint or in gesso because it neutralizes it and it takes the meaning out of it and it takes away the distraction of whatever sort of surface features there were. Um, this was a coloring book exercise and before I left home to come here from Seattle, I was talking to a friend about the different um, tasks that we would be doing and, and I explained this one to him and he said, so your students are seven? And I said, no, everybody likes to color. And I think this actually ended up being one of the more, like the simplicity of it and the, the boundaries of just having the same drawing photocopied over a hundred times and seeing the way that different people used all the same materials to treat, treat all of these similar shapes in different ways and be creative about it. I think that um, this ended up being a, you know, a pretty successful part of the workshop. So this is what the grid looks like hung up. And since I hung that, I put two extra ones at the bottom, so it's a perfect rectangle now. And as you see, they're in various states of completion. And I sort of like that. It's, it gives you a sense of time. It gives you a sense of like, this is in this early stage, this one's in this sort of middle stage, and this one's in the finished stage. And then maybe this one is like overfinished. <laughs> You know, like there's so many things going on or there's, or there's color spilling out over the edges. And then this is a detail of the piece of paper where the animated GIF was made. I really wanted to show you some animations, but I don't know if I can.